Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Yes, we'll do a little bit of catching up with what we've done so far, um, so that we'll know where to start. You see, we started by saying that both science and pre-scientific thought were looking for universals, whether it's economics or physics or life sciences. Most sciences these days believe that there are universals in that particular science. What do we mean by universals? What we mean by universals is for example, in physics there is a thing called energy that is part of the universals which, which we take for granted. Then you have all the Newtonian laws which tell you about the state of the universals at the time when Newton was writing about this cosmos. In economics, can you name any universal that we have in theoretical economics? Absolutely, that is something like an entropy law in economics, perfect. So, we have universals and all sciences are progressively in the quest for formulating universals in their domain. We saw also that universals were not formulated always in the manner in which we call it scientific today. We saw that universals in the early stages constituted matters of faith. What we are doing now is to go through a bit of Greek history which we have already done for your assignment too. A large part of the universals in Greek history initially came as a matter of faith, but gradually in the 6th and the 5th century BC, you had universals getting constituted in a manner which you might call scientific today. We started on this last time when I briefly introduce the subject to you. I shall go into greater details today on this. What I am trying to say is, you had on the one hand in Greece by the 5th century, by the 6th century, a substantial faith system, religious system both in the old Greek Olympic gods format or more recent to Greece, the Orphic cult of worship, which had become immensely popular. The Orphic cult was particularly important because it formulated something like a regular system of belief. It was not a worship of X number of gods and pacifying and propitiating them, but it was believing in certain things about the life of Dionysius and believing in certain rituals and believing most importantly in certain foundational faiths such as rebirth, reincarnation and so on and so forth. We found that when the Orphic cult was prevalent, there was a tendency for people to believe in a whole lot of things and a whole lot of rituals with which they identified as universals. For example, in the Orphic cult, reincarnation or rebirth was a normal accepted faith, which was not a part of the accepted faith if you are worshipping for instance Zeus or Apollo and so on and so forth. There was a regular story, a myth in the Orphic cult, whereby the god Dionysius is torn apart by titans and he is reborn 
once again and the rebirth of Dionysius is celebrated in the Orphic cult and the, and the physical torture leading to the death of Dionysius is celebrated as God having given up his life for people and so forth. Now, all these were part of the Dionysius faith as developed by Orpheus and subsequently followed by others. So, you have this train of thought coming up. Simultaneously, in the northern part of Greece, which is known as Ionia, there is a tendency for people to think in terms of experience. There is a tendency for people to think in terms of trying to understand experience, understand the cosmos in terms of categories derived from experience. What we shall do today is to see how they merged in Greece. They stand apart for a while, then in the thought of Pythagoras, you find the Orphic beliefs integrating with the ideas of a very great mathematician. So, this integration is what eventually leads to the ideas of Plato, before that in Socrates and then to Aristotle of, after Plato, where the element of mysticism never left philosophical thought. At the same time, philosophical thought reached great heights in terms of reason, mathematics and logic. So, this is what we are going to do today. So, let us start with a brief note on what the speculative philosophers in Greece were doing. Now, the earliest ones which we can think of are the ones who are called Milanesians. Milesians. They came from a place called Miletus and the top three of them, Thales, did we talk about Thales last time? Did we talk about Anaxagoras and Anaximenes? I remember that. So, let us look at them. Now, Thales is said to have brought these ideas to Greece from Egypt. He is supposed to have spent quite some time in Greece, picked up these ideas from Egyptians, I am sorry, in Egypt, picked up these ideas from Egyptians and then brought them along to Greece. Thales said, everything is water, the basic substance of which the cosmos is made is water and water is the original substance. So, everything else that you find in the cosmos is water converted, condensed, formulated in different ways. This is like you know ideas in uh, Indian ancient philosophy, where they said there was a single substance which constituted everything. They called it Atman, they called it Brahman. right? So, there was a similar belief in the Greeks. Thales was not talking about Atman, Brahman, that was very Hindu, but Thales was talking about water. They thought everything, Thales thought everything came from water, it is the original substance and everything came out of it. So, this was foundational. But other than that, Thales was also a person who examined the world around. He is supposed to have predicted successfully the first solar eclipse among the Greeks. I think approximately in BC 585 and it happened. So, which also means that Thales had some astronomy, Thales had some idea of the planetary movements and configurations, which is not very evident in much writing that is left, because there is not much of Thales which is left. But after Thales, we have Anaximander. Anaximander says this world is composed of one primal substance. He was not talking of water. He said water is not that primal substance, because he argued under certain conditions water becomes solid. Under certain conditions water takes the shape of the vessel into which it is put. So, it cannot be the primal original substance original substance cannot be 
condensed reduced shaped in this manner. He says the original substance is formless, shapeless, eternal. He did not name it and he did not elaborate into the detail of this. All that he says is this original substance translates itself, transforms itself sorry into other substances. These other substances could transform themselves into yet other substances. This is one of the ideas of Anaximander. Most importantly, this idea that there is an original substance which constitutes the universe, it is the first time in Greece and it influences all others subsequently. Anaximander also was talking about an idea of justice. He believed that the elements which is water, fire, air and earth, they are combined in this universe in particular proportions. If they are combined, if they stay combined in this proportions, there is harmony. But each of these elements is trying to push its domain against the others. The earth is trying to dominate over others, water is trying to dominate over others. So, there is a potential disequilibrium possible and the movement on the cosmos in states of happiness and sorrow reflect the vacillations of nature of cosmos in terms of moving away from this equilibrium proportionality rule. The Greek idea of justice among human beings derives from this cosmic idea of justice that these elements should be in some kind of a balance with each other. Nobody postulated exactly how these how this balance would work, but Anaximander certainly said that there should be some kind of a balance, some externally determined proportionality. And then he said this is where the idea of justice comes, which also means that for all gods and for all humans too, there is the similar notion of justice. So, the notion of justice evolves in those days in the writings of Anaximander, in the speeches of Anaximander as some kind of a balance, as some kind of harmony, which is what, which is, which is what justice denotes. Later ideas of Greek justice were to take a lot from this. Disorder and order in society are formulated in terms of this unspecified, but assumed harmony and proportionality among the people in the society. Would you like to write some of these down or would you like me to carry on? How would you like to do? I can pause. Would you like to write this down? Okay, take some time. Anaximander also had the claim of being the first person who ever drew a map. Nobody drew a map before that, but Anaximander is supposed to be the first person who drew a map and as a part of his attempt at speculating on the nature of the universe, he started drawing pictures about how places look like and how it was to move from one place to another. So, early maps were formulated by an Aximander in this fashion. He also 
try to estimate the size of the sun. He said the sun is certainly bigger than the earth, but how much bigger than the earth? 27 times, 28 times, he could not decide, but he decided that sun was much bigger than the earth. Most important, the first speculation about the shape of the earth is seen in the writings of Anaximander. He thought the earth was not a flat surface, but some kind of a cylinder. He thought the planet earth was cylindrically shaped. So much for Anaximander. What this little exercise into Anax Anaximander's thought shows us is that there is this parallel line developing in Greece of people who are speculating on the nature of the world, nature of the universe around, not so much based on some assumed faith or some mystical belief, but on the basis of trying to understand the world around. They are empirical and they are trying to reason out the world on basis of experience. So, Thales for instance, talking about water is an empirically based statement, because he sees the water everywhere, he says so water must be the original substance. So, Anaximander goes a step beyond that and says there is an original primeval substance, which is eternal, which constitutes the base and core of the universe. So, let us look at what Anaximenes says. Anaximenes is the third of the Milesian philosophers. As you can see, Anaximenes believed that air was the primal substance, the fundamental substance. And he says, it is air which gets conform, transformed visibly into different shapes. So, he says, if you condense water, condense air, it becomes water. If you condense it further, it becomes soil. It be, you condense it further, it becomes stone, rock and so on and so forth. So, he says, air is primal. Everything comes from air. Anaximenes has also speculated on the shape of planet earth. He said, it was like a table top, disc shaped. Now, in later days, he is said to have influenced the thought of Pythagoras quite a bit, but Pythagoras certainly did not agree that the earth was circular or disc shaped. Pythagoras was clear that earth was round, spherical, but point here is, he is said to have influenced subsequent thinkers quite influentially. Certainly, the atomists, people like Democritus and Lucifer, they believed that Anaximenes was right, that the earth was a flat, circular, table top shaped thing. But whatever, it is a speculation. One thing we must understand is that many of these people they allowed their imagination to conceive of possibilities, which their eyes and ears could not show. So, they extended, extended the sway of their imagination to try and help them conceive what the universe was like. So, whether it was air, which was the basic substance or some unnamed, unmentioned permanent substance in Anaximander or water in Thales. They were thinking, they were speculating, they were using their imagination to enable themselves to understand this world, this universe, which is why I say they are speculative philosophers. Now, Anaximenes also brought forth the idea of deductive reasoning into Greek philosophy which is basically you start with some known facts, then use logic to deduce conclusions, inferences about something which is not known. So, this method which became the core of the philosophical method was taught in the famous school which Anaximenes used to run and a number of students of his went elsewhere and propagated this basic method of reasoning, which later centuries later came to be acknowledged as the scientific method. 
the greatest contribution of Malaysians to Greece was that they put the Greek mind into interaction with the ideas that were to be found in Babylonia, in Egypt and even to some extent in Persia and Syria. So, these people had inter interacted with minds from those people, from those places and they summed up their experience and passed it on to Greeks when they taught the Greeks. So, a substantial leap forward which the Greek mind acquired in the next hundred years in philosophical thinking was based on this foundational edifice created by the Malaysian philosophers. If you want to write this down, take your time and write it. Now, Pythagoras is attributed that famous statement, the whole universe is nothing but numbers. It shows how important mathematics was in Pythagoras' scheme of things. But by himself, you cannot call him a mathematician in a modern sense of the word. There is a lot of mathematician in him, there is a lot of scientific thinking in him, but fundamentally Pythagoras belong to the Orphic cult. He formulated a religion which became quite popular actually. This religion consisted of the belief in transmigration of souls and large number of taboos, do's and don'ts. For instance, one of the things over which Pythagoras was vehement was that you should not eat beans. So, he felt that you know, people who ate beans were damned. So, you had a whole lot of taboos and belief in transmigration of souls and a deep faith in the power of contemplation. This was Pythagoras' religion. Other than the taboos, it is almost entirely Orphic in nature, especially the transmigration part. What is equally important in Pythagoras is that he started a school with his disciples in southern Italy. There were Greek cities in southern Italy, there were Greek cities in the islands, all of which were known for the powerful way in which the Orphic cult had spread. So, Pythagoras worked in the southern Italian Greek cities. He founded a school in which at one time there were supposed to be 600 disciples of his. It was a society. Later on, he migrated because his ideas and mathematics, his ideas and reason and logic conflicted not only with his own beliefs but with the beliefs of people who ruled those cities and so he had to move away. The interesting thing about Pythagoras is his idea about the importance of mathematics. How does it figure? How does it combine with transmigration of souls? How does it combine with the, a taboo on the eating of beans? How does it combine with these things? It combines with it in the way Pythagoras formulated his ethics. According to Pythagoras, virtue lay in contemplation.
And what was contemplation? Contemplation was a passionate thinking and preoccupation with what was good. And what was good here in Pythagoras, the end result of such contemplation would be the discovery of mathematical ideas. He believed that the mathematical ideas which came to him and to his disciples were products of contemplation of the abstract and the abstract by itself and then leads to what is called theory. In the Orphic tradition, theory is a word used for this kind of contemplation and the modern scientific term theory actually comes from these origins, from the Pythagorean origins. The geometric method of thinking which is to be seen in its early forms in the thought of Anaximenes develops immensely here. Start with basic axioms which are known and then use the deductive method, deductive logic to try and make sense of things which are not self evident at all. In other words, the method which you use in geometry you know we have a proposition, then you have a step by step by step proof from the given proposition to the final proof of something which is not known, which is not self evident. This method, method of thinking became common and basic to philosophy and scientific thinking ever afterwards and this is to be seen originating in the work of the Pythagorean school, he and his students. In the years to come, long, long after Pythagoras, nearly 2000 years, there was a man in France, a mathematician called René Descartes. We will be studying Descartes too, but in Descartes you find a celebration of the scientific method or the geometric method of Pythagoras lucidly illustrated in the modern form of scientific method. So, where does that come from? That comes from the Pythagorean approach to reasoning thinking. So, that is the biggest contribution you can think of as Pythagoras made. Of course, we know that the, the celebrity status of Pythagoras is associated with a theorem which is associated with his name about a triangle, but that only goes on to show how deep Pythagoras's preoccupations were. So, on the one hand he had mathematics, he had logic, he had deductive method, he had this geometric method of establishing propositions. On the other hand it was combined with the strange mysticism of earlier traditions, Orphic traditions and strange moralism arising out of a whole lot of taboos and rituals which also partly go back to the Orphic cult. So, this was a strange admixture that Pythagoras was. He left a strong mark on everything that followed him. In fact, in a very substantive way, the very thinking of Socrates, the very thinking of Plato and the very thinking of Aristotle were modeled after the Pythagorean thinking. You want to write this down? You can write all this down. See the continuum of thought here beginning from Thales 
to Pythagoras, you find there is a continuous attempt at people to fix a single principle as the foundation of existence, starting with water, going through air, going through the primal substance and in Pythagoras the contemplation, theoretic com contemplation which leads even to mathematical discoveries. There is a tendency in all these people to believe in some kind of monism. Are you aware what monism is? Can you tell me? Correct. So, everything is Brahman, that is a monism. Right, fine. So, there is a strong tendency in these people towards monism, right, to try and find a single core substance. Now, this monism has a meaning in two senses. One, this is the core substance of which the cosmos is constituted. Second, this is the sole purpose to which all life is leading. This is the purpose to which everything is going. In the second sense, monism is also teleological, right. So, monism involves not only the idea of an original cause, but it also involves the idea of teleology, which means the one purpose to which everything is going. I am saying all this because the next thinker whom I am talking to you about Heraclitus disputed all of these. Heraclitus said there is no such permanent substance like fire or water or they are all elements. There is nothing which is eternal in amongst these things. In fact, he says you cannot talk of eternity at all because everything is changing all the time what eternity can you talk, talk about? So, he was hostile towards religion because religion inculcated the belief in monism in people and Heraclitus said this was incorrect. So, his idea was the whole universe, the whole world everything was in a state of flux and he says there was nothing substantively there is no one big underlying principle which is a source of everything to which everything is leading there is no such thing he says the world is a void this universe is a void so this idea of void which heraclitus was talk heraclitus was talking about was profound in the context in, in which it came It was probably one of the earliest versions in the West where you see atheism. Not only is a disbelief expressed by Heraclitus for the Greek Olympian gods whom he looks down upon, but also for the Orphic cult with all its beliefs and rituals and festivities. He says there is nothing in this, there is only void in this universe, only void. There is no original substance at all. He also believed that everything contained in itself the opposites. If you are talking about black, then that black might con must contain within itself both white and black. If you are talking about cold, then that cold substance must contain within itself both hot and cold. 
He says there is nothing which exists on its own. Everything contains only the opposites. Now there are two or three interesting directions of thought which are possible from Heraclitus in Greece. One is a parallel which happened in India. Buddha was reacting in India to all the teachers who had taught him one form of monism or not. All kinds of teachers were involved. He went from one to another. Each one gave him one ultimate substance to contemplate on, to meditate on. And he found he did not get anywhere. And Buddha found eventually there is really nowhere to go. There is no teleology in life. And he formulated a theory of the cosmos which was magnificently articulated and expanded on by his great disciple Nagarjuna. Nagarjuna wrote a great work called Madhyamika Karika in which he introduced the argument for the first time in Indian philosophy of Chanabhangavada. Everything changes from one chana, one moment to another, exactly as Heraclitus was saying. Equally important in the Madhimika Karika, Nagarjuna also says. The universe is nothing but sunyata, void. So you find on parallel streams, there are two oppositions made to monism. In the east, it comes about the same time in the words of Buddha. And in the west, in Greece, it comes in the form of the sayings of Heraclitus. Not only this, Buddha too argued that everything should be seen in terms of binary opposites. In other words, you can never understand happiness unless you understood sorrow. You can never understand darkness. You can never understand light unless you understood darkness. You can never understand pleasure unless you knew pain. It was the same set of arguments, which is the reason Buddha says the whole of life is a continuous attempt by human beings to escape from sorrow. He never said people are trying to seek happiness, but he was saying in trying to think of happiness they were actually escaping from sorrow. So, he says samsara is dukkha. So, you find substantial parallel even looking at them briefly between what Buddha and his disciples did and then Heraclitus in Greece. Equally important is the impact again more nearly 2000 years later on modern thinking in Europe of Heraclitian ideas. The Heraclitian idea that things are opposed to each other, that things are unity of opposites, everything contains the opposites within them. This idea was picked up by the great German philosopher Hegel. After Heraclitus, you do not find this unity of opposites in Greece, certainly not in the writings of Plato, Aristotle, Socrates. 
No. In fact, they are all reverting to monism of one kind or another. But Heraclitus is reborn in the writings of Hegel 2000 years and more later. Does any one of you have some idea of what Hegel was writing? Did you study Hegel sometime? Beautiful, I could see you nodding your head because it was all very familiar. Very nice. What is dialectic? Take a shot. Beautiful, beautiful. Beautiful. And Hegel used dialectics in a manner in which it was not used by Plato, Aristotle and company. They were using dialectics or dialectician as a man who debated. Dialectics to mean debate. Whereas, Hegel was using dialectic to mean something else, namely unity of the opposites. And this is entirely attributable to the ideas of Heraclitus. Having said that, I must also add that it was not that Hegel was entirely Heraclitian. There was a basic foundation of Plato also in Hegel, which I will not illustrate at this point for fear of confusing you. But there is a very great book which you might like to read by Karl Popper. It is called Open Society and Its Enemies. I think it is a true masterpiece. So, in Open Society and Its Enemies, Popper traces the origins of Hegelianism not so much onto Heraclitus, but onto Plato. Simply because, according to Hegel, there is a notion of the fundamental idea, some kind of an abstract nirvana, some kind of an abstract liberation into which all humanity gets into once the dialectical process is gone through by human society through history. Finally, everybody reaches the idea, which is a very platonic thing as we shall see shortly. But the way to getting to that idea was very Heraclitian. The dialectic idea was born more from the influence of Heraclitus than from anything platonic. Anyway, all this is by way of being an aside on the profundity of Heraclitian thought. But strangely, The Greek mind went into a very peculiar dilemma after this. Should we accept monism? Should we accept the void? There is nothing. How can there be no void? Or how can you have one principle which is both the cause and the purpose of existence? So, the, the Greek mind was preoccupied with this. To the extent, as we shall see, that people speculated even the, on the existence of atomic structure in order to resolve this dilemma of the civilization. Is it all a void or is it monistic? People say that this period of Greece, say commencing around 1530, 1520, going right through, I am sorry, not 15, sorry, 530, 520 BC, going right through up to 
so 420, 410 BC, a 100 year plus period was the golden era of Greece. Certainly, there has been no such short space in the history of any part of the world which has produced so much thought, so much brilliance and so much speculation. And Heraclitus sounded one end of this kind of thought and the other as you can say the Milesians had already articulated in terms of monism. So what we shall do next is to look at what happened when people were thrown into this dilemma, what happened to speculative philosophy, what happened to science, what happens to investigative thinking. You have any questions on this so far? All right, we will break it up. Then.